But everybody will speak from a more general perspective and I'll speak about functioning issues. In this picture, where you can see part of the lake, you have the possibility to see the main four habitats. So you've got the uh, floating vegetation in the middle, then closer to us. So you've got 1,000 hectares, 500 of uh, floating macrophyte, and then uh, you've got uh, uh, reed bed. And you've got a dike built in the 19th century where you've got farming areas. Um, uh, meadows that can be flooded and other facilities. This area is famous for its birds with Kamark. It's among the main areas for colonial birds for Grey Heron. It was the first spot in the world, first breeding site for spoonbill, great white egret and uh, continental great cormorant, second biggest colony for ducks, 270 species. Here you see chronologically beginning of the 20th century, one species, purple heron, first world war. Uh, you had gray heron, then black crown, uh, reglet heron, little egret, and then spoon bill, great cormorant, and others species like the sacred ibis, and the last species, the glossy ibis. The more a colony or a site has species, the more attractive it is for new species. Exponential increase. Some species temporarily disappeared due to cold period. In particular, in uh, 1984-85, main factor of search biodiversity 
en grande partie inaccessible à l'homme. Much of the forest is difficult to access for human beings. So, because first of all it was a private property and afterwards it was a reserve. So it's one of the most quiet areas in France of this type. Second factor, these birds don't live only in this area. They also live in two main uh, marshes, the first one not far from there, the Bay of Borneo, 25,000 hectares by the Atlantic Ocean, and the other marsh is the Loire estuary. So many of these colonial birds and ducks feed on both these areas. Third factor since 2007, a change, a trophic change, the invasion of Louisiana crawfish that is terrible for the habitat but very useful for big birds as a feeding uh, resource. The uh, populations of these birds in 1981, the uh, gray heron, heron up to 1,300 pairs. Now it's a bit it's less, around three or 400 pairs. Others species have appeared and are competing with the grey heron in particular regarding feeding activities. Altogether we've got 4,000 pairs, whatever the species, with a majority of cattle egret, which is not particularly an uh, an aquatic, an aquatic uh, species. For ducks, we can see more wintering ducks after 1997, maybe because they were hunted before. 1997, you also have to take into account the fact that in this area, uh, some mallards were released for hunting, so they were competing with uh, the wild ducks. However, this bird diversity hides the flip side of the coin, the water quality, in particular hyper-eutrophication. Despite all the different protecting measures, national and international ones, European directive we've spoken about among them. Also, I have to take into account the main difference between the situation in summer and winter. In summer, it's 4,000 hectares in winter. Everything is flooded one and a half meters higher, reaching a surface of 6,300 hectares. The lake is only 70 centimeters, 1.20 centimeters, one meter 20 centimeters high. <coughs> 
summer of one twelve of the situation of Conlieu in its uh, catchment area, the two main hydraulic constraints, the annual flux, it changes a lot from one year to another. And the critical factor is the absence of flux in summer that doesn't compensate the evapotranspiration. And we cannot find water to compensate this loss. Artificial, artificialization of the hydraulics in the 18th century a dike was built up on the Loire estuary to stop a tidal wave to invade the lake. And also, a draining of peatland in order to uh, gain uh, land in the south and in the sore north and a device, a facility to uh, pump out the water uh, the rocky threshold was also uh, destroyed on the Ajno and in the south we connected the Boulogne to the end of the lake in order to drain water is as uh, soon as possible from the meadows. The dam of Bois was built up in the 19th century and as a consequence uh, we saw the uh, Saltation of this area. So once again, the uh, rocky threshold was lowered and a water gate was uh, built in order to control the water level. In the 60s, the canal of Etier, in order to connect directly the uh, <coughs> exit of the lake to the center of the lake in the 20th century increase of speed of flow from the catchment area switching from uh, three hours to uh, three days to three hours and the uh, urban planning also put much pressure. So we switched from a really fluctuant system regarding water level to something more stable. And on the right, you can see that in the 60s, 70s, the uh, water level was managed very smoothly and precisely. Four main factors can explain this change from an oligotrophic situation to the hyper-eutrophic lake we have today. Unfortunately, these conclusions don't take into account the uh, evolution of farming around Grand Lieu in particular uh, with market gardening, so lower summer water level, so different uh, speed of reaction of the ecosystem, strong increase of agricultural nutrients for the last 40 years, nitrate and phosphorus, the introduction of Kuiper 
changing the functioning of the ecosystem and shifting from the clear water balance supported by the uh, submerged macrophytes. So a shift to the turbid water situation. Given the water level, it is impossible to make a difference between the farming zone in the south and the rest of the lake, because we don't have any dike. The situation is different from the one in the Netherlands. This is one of the uh, basic data we've got to take into account. The water level is the same whether it is a natural zone or farming zone. Second factor, we don't really take enough into account because we lack of measures. So the areas uh, gained on the uh, peat bog area, and now it is used for uh, pastoring and the central part, in particular the floating forests go sedimenting because they accumulate pollution, hence the level rises, although we have to work with the same water level, whatever the zones, and with only a 20 centimeter change, we can see a drop of productivity of water lilies of 54%. Hence, we find a productivity that is stronger. If we see the situation of output and input of um, nitrates, the measuring stations are not precise enough. And we don't really take into account the catchment area that is uh, close to the lake. So with this annual graphics, we don't show concentrations, but when we compare that to, with the flow, the difference between output underneath and input above, we see variations quite uh, important from one year to another. In particular, for our suspended matters, and we can go from a very low situation to very high situations from one year to another. As in Brittany, the nitrate concentration has been multiplied by 30. Remember that the lake used to be a oligotrop. To give you an idea, in order for you to understand better, it's the equivalent of 300 big, uh, 38 ton trucks. If we speak about quantity, and it's the situation of the water in Brittany and in Pays de la Loire area. Recording uh, Kaipu, you can see 
Oh, my cancer, sorry. All the... Microphones. And they could uh, avoid the resuspension, suspension of the mud. And ten years after the introduction of Maya Kesa, all these uh, macrophytes had disappeared. The uh, turbidity situations and the erosion are not comparable to what they used to be here. You see the center of the lake and the area of uh, floating macrophyte are cleared and the bank or the bed used to serve as a vegetation generation. Now this area has disappeared. The same for the uh, zone in between. Of course, of course uh, waves attacking banks, a destruction of floating forests. The action of the castor is double, but it's because it does not only graze, it also has an impact because as there is uh, more sediment, plants cannot breathe anymore. The new vegetation will be introduced by Jean-Marc in the 80s. Chestnut wood. Water chestnut was the main plant, only 80 hectares. And now water lilies occupy all the areas that it used to be occupied by cert. Uh, Transparency underneath is shown with the disappearance of all the submerged macrophytes. The vicious circle of change, what happens in winter, what comes from the uh, catchment area, only part of the uh, deuterant. Uh, goes out of the lake, plant production starts in spring, and the water lilies use the phosphorus in the sediment, and even if we stopped uh, water lilies uh, uh, it's one century, it would take one century to stop this process. So turnover of nymphia leaves, 13 days. Mud productivity of this. Uh, Mud is 80,000 tons. The impact is spectacular. In 2004, the cyanobacteria were mainly present in the central part of the lake. In 2006, all the uh, floating uh, macrophytes were impacted and now the whole lake is impacted by the uh, concentration of phytotoxins. Back to birds, hopefully, I mean, we're happy they 
they live also in other areas because botulism is present everywhere in the mud and close to floating forests. Anoxia of sediments is toxin is very dangerous. So with a couple of petulic toxin emission, you have a terrible impact on the fauna between 100 and 800 birds die every year with a deep crisis. Almost 95% of the birds were killed. 25,000 birds died. Thank you for your, thank you for listening and uh, we hope that our effort on uh, improving the catchment area will allow us to get to the situation we saw in the Netherlands. Now we've got some time for one question, maybe. I don't have a question. I want to make a comment on the Grand Lieu area. I think we have spoken of one parameter. We should speak about the bacteria that develops on the surface of the sediment. And it is something that has to be dealt with, in particular in areas where the water is shallow. Just to comment after what uh, Loïc has said, and in particular the fact that the uh, Maya Castor is uh, guilty. So we also have to specify that cyanobacteria can also produce substances that impact the development of macrophytes. I definitely agree with you, but in 20 minutes we have to select what we say, so we focus on the main points. But yes, it's a multi-factor situation. Everything is connected. Vous avez dit que le lac était oligotropique, oligotrope dans les années 60. Est-ce qu'il était vraiment oligotrope, c'est-à-dire microphyte et euh, au clair, mais en ce qui concerne la concentration des nutriments, est-ce que c'était bien oligotrope bah oui. The concentration of nitrates and phosphorus was also much less than today. I used to swim in the lake. I used to drink the water. Now, no one would dare to do that. So submerged macrophytes were all over the lake and under the floating ma macrophytes and also around the central with Caracea, Potomote, Mariafi. So you had 15 different species of submerged macrophytes that uh, allowed the uh, water to be completely clear. But maybe Jean-Marc will give you some more information about that. We've seen that water lilies have a important role in uh, degradating the water and what about fish? The load per hectare can they impact the water quality? I haven't had the opportunity to speak about fish. There was also a shift in the fish population. We lost all the uh, clear water species that used to live there until the, 19, the 1950s. 
and we have only have, only have the information given by the fishermen, so we don't have a very precise uh, piece of information about that. But Cyprinid, uh, we've got uh, we mainly have uh, Zander and <coughs> eels, of course. Uh, the general evolution of the population, an example, in the feeding uh, uh, regime, the feeding diet of the grey heron that used to be 70% of their diet. Now it's only 1%. And we know that the way the heron, the herons feed show as what is available regarding praise. But apart from that, the evolution of fish population in Grandlieu is clear. Figures are we sampled and there is no change in biomass, no obvious change in biomass. It's just the uh, qualitative situation of the population, given your expertise today, can we go backwards with less uh, casters? Could we go back to a former situation? I don't believe in this solution because this area is difficult to access and we don't have the means to do it in a effective way. Casters go out of the lake when the water is too high and um, they come back. When the water goes down, the issue here, if you take mud, and if you try, if you dry it, you can find all the seeds of the plants that used to be there. So all the submerged macrophyte could come back if the conditions changed. So maybe acting on the casters could be a solution, but also the anoxia of the sediment is also uh, a trial to follow. But there is proof that even if we cut all the uh, input in the uh, catchment area, the system would go on for one century, so it's a very slow reaction. <laughs>